chapter 17. It's good to have each and every one of you with us this morning. First Kings chapter 17. I'm going to begin reading with verse number 17. Actually, to give you a prelude to that, let's start with 16. And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. And it came to pass after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick. And his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. And she said unto Elijah, What have I to do with thee, O thou man of God? Art thou come unto me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? And he said unto her, Give me thy son. And he took him out of her bosom and carried him up into a loft where he abode and laid him upon his own bed. And he cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, as thou also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourned by slaying her son. And he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah. And the soul of the child came into him again and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down out of the chamber into the house. And delivered him unto his mother. And Elijah said, See, thy son liveth. And the woman said unto Elijah, Now by this I know that thou art a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in thy mouth is truth. And the church said, Amen. 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 You can be seated this morning. Me and wife, he's glad he's had a big smudge there. I was trying to have to read around. I couldn't see. Things happen, young people, as you get a little older, <laughs> whether you like it or not. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I want to think on a thought this morning just for a few minutes. Trust in the Lord when the good times turn bad. Yeah. Yeah. Trust in the Lord when the good times turn bad. I read a saying one time that said there's a secret to living without worry, without stress, and without disappointment, without frustration. And the answer to that is, is don't get involved in your own life. That's the only way you're going to avoid stress and frustration and disappointment in this life today. But life, as we all know, is full of surprises. Some of them good, some of them bad. But one of the most disconcerting things or the troubling experiences of life is when it's going good and everything seems to be going well and all of a sudden in the blink of an eye things begin to turn sour. Things are going great in life. Life is full of blessing. It's a joy to live every day. Matter of fact, you look forward to every morning to get up and then without warning your fortunes turn. Bad news hits you like a load of bricks, like a meteor hitting the surface of the earth. A family crisis, a medical condition, a divorce, financial circumstances, whatever that it may be, troublesome times come upon all of us, many times unaware. Amen? Amen. And most of the time when the crisis comes, it is met with shock and surprise because we're not looking for it. We don't expect it when it hits like that, when things turn all of a sudden. So our first response is with shock and surprise. We wonder how life can be so good today and all of a sudden it falls apart the next. Well, this is what happened to the little widow woman in Zarephath with Elijah. She welcomed the prophet Elijah into her house. And if you remember the story, begin with the first, well, beginning back some time ago, but uh, the Bible tells us there in the first part of chapter 17 that the word of the Lord came to Elijah. And Elijah prophesied because of the evil that was in the land that there was going to be a drought. There was going to be no rain, no dew, no water upon the earth for, the, for a very long time. And the Bible said that as the drought progressed over a few years, the ground began to dry up, the rivers began to dry up. Matter of fact, God had hid Elijah down by a brook and he caused ravens 
used to come and defeat him every day. But the Bible tells us that one day the brook dried up. Amen. And God spoke to Elijah and he said, I want you to go to Zarephath. And there I have commanded a little widow woman to sustain thee. This give me a thought today, church. It was three and a half years that there was no rain upon the face of the earth. The ground would be dry, would begin to crack. All the rivers and the waters would dry up the weed and the barley would die in the fields and the corn would waste away. This drought and famine had hit the land. But God sent a man of God to a little widow woman. And he said, this little widow woman is going to sustain thee. When he comes to the little widow woman's house, she's out gathering sticks, getting ready to fix something to eat. And he tells the little widow woman, he said, will you uh, fix me a cake of something to eat? And he, she said, sir, I don't even have a cake to fix to eat, but I'm going to fix what we got left for me and my son, and then we're going to die. Or in other words, what she said, this is all we have left, and we're probably going to die of starvation. She said, I don't even have a cake. He said, I tell you what, the say of the Lord, fix me a little okay oh. first and then fix you something for your son and yourself. Notice verse number 16 then. It said the barrel of meal wasted not neither the cruise of oil fell according to the word of the Lord that was spoken by Elijah. Can I tell you God has the power and the ability to sustain us today in troubles and times. He's got the ability today to take care of us when the rest of the world is falling apart. When there's three and a half years of trouble. Three and a half years of famine. God knows how to supply and to sustain yeah. his people. Yeah. Hallelujah to God today. So I like that scripture. The cruise of oil did not fail. The barrel of meal did not waste. But when everything was going good, when life was blessed and God was pouring out blessing, I mean the cruise of oil was running over. Her and her son didn't go hungry. The bread just kept coming out of nothing. Then, the Bible says, her son became ill and stopped breathing. Mm -hmm. Ain't that the way life is? Everything's going good. Seems like everything's working out for you. You look at the bank account and you thought, man, I didn't know I had that much money left. <laughs> and you, you go out and you decide you're going to go down Sonic because you got a little extra money in the bank this payday. You don't have to eat soup beans for the fourth time this week. Hallelujah to God today. But then all of a sudden when you get back home from Sonic, you look and your bank account's overdrawn because you forgot about a check that it came out and a bill that you paid and things change. In a moment, God had sent Elijah to this little widow woman and God had blessed her because she was taking care of him and God's blessing was upon that house. But all of a sudden, even in the midst of the blessing, her son falls over dead. Ain't that the way life happened? The Bible didn't say that he died, but that's the implication. She goes on to Elijah and finds him. She had fixed a little room for him to stay in. And she goes and she said in verse number 18, What have I to do with the old man of God? In other words, she was saying, what do you have against me? Did you come to remind me of my sins and kill my son? Notice the external crisis became an internal crisis of faith. That's what happens to many people. Things happen in our life. We don't know how to deal with them. And that external crisis becomes an internal crisis. And we've got to know how to deal with it by faith today. Many folks fall out of church. They quit communicating with their friends. Don't let external crisis cause an internal crisis in your soul today. Keep trusting in the Lord. Keep having confidence in God today. You see, she thought it was because of some sin that she had done and because the prophet had come, the presence of God had come and it revealed her sin and God was bringing judgment on her. Now there's times that we need to analyze. We need to look for hidden causes. But that's not always the case. The disciples did the same thing when Jesus walked by and, and he saw a man that was blind from his birth. If you remember, the disciples said, Master, uh, who did cause this man to be blind? Was it his mom or dad? Who Whose sin caused this to happen? That's just the way we think sometimes, but it's not always the case because Jesus said neither did this happen. This is not a result. This is not a judgment of sin. But the key to conquer the crisis in our life 
is to keep our confidence and trust in God that he will make a way. Amen. Keep our confidence and trust in God that God will make a way through the crisis. Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. I will maintain my way before him. In other words, when it feels like that God is setting me up for a mark and shooting arrows against me. When it feels like he's treading upon me like a giant. Even though he slays me, I'm going to keep on walking for him. I'm going to keep on trusting for him. In the midst of my circumstance, I'm going to trust in him. In the midst of my turmoil, I'm going to trust in him. In the midst of my depression, I'm going to trust in him. In the death of my son, I'm going to trust in him. In the failure of my family, I'm going to trust in him. In sickness and in disease, I'm going to keep trusting in him. Though he slay me, I'll maintain my way before him. Don't let the external crisis create an internal crisis of your faith. The psalmist said, what time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. In God, I will praise his word. In God, I put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. Now, fear and distress comes on all of us. It don't matter if you've been five, been baptized five times, speak in tongues every day. When trouble comes and turmoil comes, it causes us to be afraid. Right. Yes. It causes us to be a little distressed. I felt like yesterday was, uh, when I left the hospital, I put mom in the Lord's hands and I trusted God, but I didn't know the outcome. I still don't know the outcome. I don't have to know the outcome. But I know who holds the outcome. Amen. 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 The psalmist said, when I am afraid, and I am confused, and when I am distressed, I'm going to keep trusting you. Yeah. Many people give up on God when they get distressed. Many of them give up on the Lord when they run into turmoil. But the, the, Solomon wrote in Proverbs, and he said, trust the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean to your own understanding. You see, trust is not based in my ability. It's not based. Trust is not based upon my faith. It's not based upon my education. It's not based upon my ability. But trust is based upon the presence and the providence and the power of Almighty God. Amen. Yeah. I said trust is based upon the presence and providence of the and the power of the living God. You see, it is faith that holds it all together for us today. You don't have to lose your mind. You don't have to smoke that joint. You don't have to drink that Budweiser or, or that fifth of liquor because our trust in the Lord is what holds us together today. Yeah. Yeah. Reminds me of the man that was reading a magazine and his little girl kept aggravating him wanting to know, Daddy, what does the country of the United States, what does it look like? And relentlessly, she would not let him rest. He couldn't enjoy reading his magazine. And he happened to come across a page in the magazine that had a picture of the United States. So in an effort to kindly appease her, he tore the picture of the United States out. He tore it in several pieces. He said, now take this in the other room and work on it and see if you can put it together. Wasn't very long that she comes back in there and presents it to him and taped it all together and had it uh, perfectly fitted. And he looked at it and he said, that was... Uh, a very good job, but how in the world did you put it together so quickly? She said, well, on the other side of the picture, on the back side of the map was a picture of Jesus. And when I put Jesus where he belonged, our country just came together. How much truth is there to that this morning? Amen. If we stop focusing on the things that we see and we hear on the news, if we put our focus on Jesus Christ, who is the author and the finisher of our faith today, he'll put this world back together when we put God in his proper place today. So I'm going to give you a couple things this morning that I see in this picture when, when we need to trust the Lord when good things turn bad. First of all, we need to turn it over to God. Yeah. Some people don't turn it over to God. They turn it over to the big ear on the other side of the telephone. <laughs> huh? yeah. They tell their neighbors, they tell their friends. They call their lawyer. They tell everybody else that they need to turn it over to God. 
Yeah. They'll come to the altar and cry a few tears, say, Lord, I'm going to give it to the Lord. But they drag it out like a piece of toilet paper stuck to their shoe on the way out the door, and they take it back home, and they spend all evening worrying, all evening stressing what they are supposed to give to the Lord. We need to turn it over to the Lord. Amen. Look at verse number 19. When she told him about her son, what did Elijah say? He said, give me your son. She had to give him up. Yeah. She had to turn him over. She had to let go. He said, give me your son. And he took him out of her bosom and carried him up into the loft where he abode and laid him upon his own bed. I believe that when we turn things over to the Lord, we're able to experience the peace of Almighty God. The psalmist said, cast your burdens upon the Lord and he shall sustain thee. He'll never suffer the righteous to be moved. First Peter said, casting all your cares upon him for he careth for you. He said, give me your son. He took her and took him out of her arms and carried him up to the room where that he was staying. She would have never had the peace. She never got the answer to the prayer until she was willing to let go and let God do what God only God was able to do. You see, we've got to turn things over to the Lord that are beyond our power and our ability to be able to fix. We've got to trust that God's peace and power will intervene in our circumstances. We need to turn it over to the Lord. And when we turn it over to Him, we experience peace. But not only when we turn it over to the Lord, do we experience peace. And we got a world full of people that need His peace. Amen. They're looking for it in everywhere. Amen. They're looking for it in a, in a, in, they're looking for it in a political party. You ain't going to get it. Amen. All that the political parties is going to do is a fight and war against one another and try to keep you mad at somebody else and put the blame on everybody else and never explain never uh, take responsibility for the things that they do. Stop looking for the government to fix your problem. Amen. Uh, only thing the government is going to do is to put us in bondage and put us put us in chains and, and we'll need deliverance from that. That's the only thing that the government is going to do. But when we turn it over to God, not only do we experience God's peace, but when we turn things over to God, that is when we will experience His power. She would have never known what God could do unless she turned everything over to God. She would have never known what God was able to do unless she was willing to give her son up to a man of God. Hallelujah to God. A man of God that took him up to his room and performed intercessory prayer. After she gave it up to God, she saw the power of God work in her life. I'm telling you, we need to put our confidence in God and if we'll turn it over to God, we'll see God work. We'll see the power of God in our life today. You see, she experienced this power. As we'll see here in a minute, the boy comes back to life. When we turn our situation, she turned her son over to the prophet Elijah. She turned her circumstances over to the man of God. But can I tell you, we don't turn our situations over to a preacher. We turn it over to one that's greater than Elijah. Jesus Christ, the high priest of God that makes intercession for you and me today. Amen? Some say, well, things don't always work out that way. And they don't. As I was developing this and I came to this point, I thought, things don't always work out the way we want them to. Don't mean God don't answer the prayer. It's just not what we asked for, what we wanted. Amen. And I can tell you when I went to the coroner's office and saw my boy laying there in that body bag, mm -hmm. everything in me to do, not to climb up on his body and lay myself upon him like Elijah did. Do you believe God was could raise him? I believe that God could have raised him up right then. I believe that. Yes. if it was within his will yeah. and that scripture ran through my mind because I didn't want to lose my boy I didn't want my boy to go but I realized some things don't always turn out exactly the way they do in certain stories yeah. in the scripture mm -hmm. the problem is we look for those and that's what we expect and that's what mm -hmm. we want and in every case we, that may not turn out exactly the way that we want to, but we can know that we've turned our crisis over and it's in the hands of an all-powerful God. Amen. Wasn't nothing I could do for my son standing there beside that table except love on him and pet on him and look at him for that last time. That's all that I could do. But what I could not do, I turned it over to an all-powerful creator that created us out of the dust of the earth and that knew my son better than I knew my son, that loved my son even more than I loved my son, and I turned it over to him 
Hallelujah to God. It may not always work out the way that I want. He may not always come when you want him, but he is always going to be on time. Hallelujah to God. I put my trust and my confidence in him today. Amen. Though we may experience death on this side of eternity, one day we're going to experience the resurrection of eternal life on yes. the other side of him. Amen. Amen. Yes. So we need to turn it over to the Lord. And then we need to pray like we never prayed before. You know that God honors intercessory prayer. Yes. Now I can't I can't go into great detail about intercessory prayer, and some of you maybe have experienced it. And, and basically, mainly, when you're putting yourself in somebody else's place, you're performing intercessory prayer. And in a such a selfish, self-centered society that we live in. I'd say that intercessory prayer is few and far between Amen. and hard to find. Amen. Because if you don't take the time to help a brother in the middle of the day, I seriously doubt you're going to spend your spare time laying in the floor in your bedroom crying out to God on somebody else's behalf. But there are those that do intercessory prayer. And that's exactly what happened here. In the New Testament, we find in the book of James that Elijah is used as an example of a righteous man that prayed fervently. Uh, in uh, the book of James, chapter 5, it said that Elijah was a man of like passion, just like us. And, and then he goes on to say that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Amen. The effectual fervent Fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. I looked up that word fervent again, and it means passionate, sincere, intense, earnest, vehement. It means passionately. And Elijah, when Elijah prayed, he didn't pray. Now, you know, there's times to pray that we need to pray fervently. There's times that we need to pray. We need to pray passionately. Now, when you're sitting down to eat a bologna sandwich, you don't have to get into a big theological prayer. Now, God, oh, God bless this bologna. Glory in this bologna sandwich. Bless it with that tomato on it. Bless this bologna sandwich. I lift this bologna sandwich up to you. You don't have to pray like that at lunch. You can simply say, Lord, I thank you for this food that I'm about to receive. And if some joker back there has put his jelly hands on it, kill him. Kill those germs. But there's times when you're standing by the bedside of a loved one that is on the brink of death. It's time to get fervent. It's time to get passionate. Like the little women that sent their sons and daughters out to war. Hallelujah to God that spent hours laying beside the bed pouring tears upon the floor praying that God would protect their children. Look at what Elijah does. First of all in verse number 20. He calls upon the Lord and he asks the Lord, have you brought evil upon this widow woman I'm staying with by killing her son? Is that, is that what's going on? Have you brought evil upon her? And by doing this, Elijah acknowledges the sovereignty of God. What he recognizes when he says that is that only God can give life. Yeah. I think what he's saying is he's saying, God, if you took this boy's life, and he's not going to be able to recover. Have you took this? Was it because of judgment upon this widow woman? Is this why that you took this child? Because sometimes preachers don't have the answer, folks. Sometimes preachers don't know it all. I know some of them act like they do. But preachers don't have all the answers. Sometimes we don't know what to say. Hallelujah to God. But Elijah recognized and he acknowledged the sovereignty of God. We need to acknowledge God's sovereignty that I may not be able to control this situation, but I know the God that I serve is able to control this situation today. And what did Elijah do? He petitioned God fervently. Look at verse 21. Now the Bible tells us that Elijah took the child and put him on his own bed in verse 21 and he stretched himself upon the child three times and he cried unto the Lord oh Lord my God I pray thee let this child's soul come into him again I thought that was interesting 
He stretched himself over the boy's body. He laid himself. He laid the boy on the bed and he laid on top of the boy. Three times. Why three? Three's the number of completion. Three's the number of the Trinity. Three days he come out of the grave. The number three is the, is the number of completion. Daniel prayed three times a day. So Elijah done what would have been complete if the boy had never raised, and I believe Elijah would have got up and said, the Lord's called the boy home. He's not coming back. But he called upon and acknowledged the sovereignty of God and recognized that this boy lives again. It's not going to be because of what the preacher does. It's going to be because God answers this prayer. Hallelujah to God today. He threw his body upon this boy. And I don't think he whispered a prayer. I believe if you walked by that house, you would have heard the groaning and the moaning and the calling out to God. I believe he was passionate and he said, Oh! God, let their boys, let his soul come back in him again today. I call upon you today, God. I believe he was passionate about it. I believe he believed in it. I, I believe he was seeking God for it. I, hallelujah to God because he knew there is no hope outside of what God can do in this place today. And that ain't the best part. Next, look at verse 22. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah. I like to come out of my chair last night because that just hit me afresh and anew. God heard the voice of Elijah. Now, if I call your phone, you got an answer machine, nine times out of ten, I won't leave a message because I hate the sound of my voice. I hear myself talk back and I'm like, ah. Why couldn't he give me one of them big, deep voices like you know, Like some of them movie stars. But he gave me mine, and it just about makes me sick. But you know what? You might not like it. I may not like it. But when God hears it, he knows the sound of my voice. Hallelujah. He knows the sound of your voice. It's good to know today when our circumstances change from good to bad in a blink of an eye that God is able to distinguish your voice when the kids was little and we was out and around. There'd be all kinds of kids everywhere hollering and screaming. But if Lexi or Tyler or Lexi or Hannah, one of them was to say, Daddy, honey, it caught my ear. I knew where they was at in the midst of all of them. I'm telling you, we got a shepherd that knows his sheep. He knows who we are today. He hears our voice this morning. He hears the voice of Elijah. And when he hears the voice of Elijah, the soul of the boy came back in him again. And the Bible said he revived. Ain't it good to know that God hears your voice? Yeah. Yes. You're not just throwing stuff up in the air. When I pray, I'm not just throwing words out in the wind. But there is a God that hears my voice. Amen. Hallelujah to God. That's good to know when you get down to pray. If you're sincere and you're a child of God, I believe he hears your voice. Jeremiah prophesied through Jeremiah and he said it like this. Call unto me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things that thou knowest not. Hallelujah to God. Sometimes we just need to call on him. Sometimes we just need to acknowledge his sovereignty. Sometimes we just need to be a little fervent when we pray. If we'll pray, it'll be effectual. If we'll pray, things will begin to happen. I'm telling you, God still answers prayer today. The boy's life came back in him. And I believe God will give life to situations that seem to be hopeless yes, to you and me today. He gives life, Paul said, to the dead things. He gives life to the dead and he calls things that are not as though they were. Nothing is hopeless when God enters the equation. Yeah. I said nothing is hopeless Amen. when God enters right. into the equation. All things are possible with him. Yes. And lastly this morning, we need to turn things over to God. When we turn things over to God, we'll experience His peace, we'll experience His power. But we also need to petition God. We need to petition Him. If we're serious about it, we'll petition Him fervently. Yes. We'll petition Him fervently. Yeah. But we also need to realize the purpose of God's workings and the purpose of any miracles that may take place is not so much for our benefit but for his glory. Yeah. For his glory. You see, the woman said to Elijah in verse 24, 
I thought this was funny. She said, Now by this I know that you're a man of God and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is true. I'm thinking back that just a few days ago or ever how long it was that when she went and gathered that little bit of meal and that last bit of oil and poured the last drip out of the cruise and the man of God blessed it and it just kept running over, I thought she would have thought he was a man of God then. Mm -hmm. Huh? Yeah. But how many knows that we can have confidence in God and we can see God work in our life, but then a situation come in the blink of an eye that's a little more detrimental, a little more serious, a little shocks us a little bit more and how it... And that external crisis comes in and, and causes an internal crisis of our faith. Yes, God's been blessed us. Yes, we trust God. We believe God. But now this is a little bit more serious. Where are we going to stand? And the woman, I don't think that she was having doubts necessarily. I believe she thought he was a man of God when he performed the miracle before. But I believe she said, now it removes all doubt. Hallelujah to God. Today, sometimes when we face circumstances and we see the hand of God bless us, we believe in God, we trust in God. We go to church like happy little church people, but when the big hammer drops and something serious comes into our life, a disease that there is no cure for, a child that's never going to come back, a circumstance that really shakes our foundation, it is then we got to put our feet on the rock and say, I know that God is still God and I'm going to put my trust in Him. She said, by now, by this, I know you're a man of God. You see, Jesus, when he performed miracles, he, the, the miracles confirmed his message. John chapter 2, verse 11, went the wedding of the Cana of Galilee, he, it says that this beginning of miracles Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory. And his disciples believed on him. So the things that God does for us in our life, and you may be a good person, but it's not so much that you're a good person, but it's because God's a good God. Amen. And God's not wanting people to see you, but he's wanting people to see him. Amen. The works of God and his miracles are not an end in themselves. It's not just about the miracle. It's not just about the works. But they're given by God that people may know that God is and that he cares and that men may be drawn by him. The whole purpose of Jesus moving and working and healing the sick was to show that he was the power of God and he was the glory of God. And he said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. Hallelujah. Amen. With this, I'm going to close as they come to the music.